Now, last week, we talked about how this situation that our family has been going through for the last couple of weeks and is still going through fit into the messages that we've been preaching on being captured by grace. Now, I do want to let you know that the book that we've been going through, and I gave some copies of the book away over the last few weeks, Rebecca was telling me that she reads a little bit every day, and she said it is just wonderful, the mindset that it puts her in before she goes to work, and how it just reminds her of how much God loves her, and what the work that Jesus did for us changed our relationship with God. And she said, it is just so wonderful to be able to read that every day. And I said, I agree. I'm going through the book too. And did you know that this Friday night at seven o'clock, the author of the book, Pastor Ben Daly from Dallas, is going to be here doing a gospel circle. And she said, I did not know that. And I thought, I bet more people in our church don't know that. Because we just made that decision this week. I went to a gospel circle with Ben Daly about two and a half years ago. And it was one of the first times I've listened to another preacher preach. And I thought, wait a minute, he's weird just like me. Because I say all kinds of things that I don't hear any other preacher say. But he was saying them. And I went up and I met him afterwards and we hit it off and we talked. And a month later, they called to see if maybe they could come do a gospel circle at Bethel. They don't do them at churches, but they wanted to do one at Bethel. And I said, of course. And boy, did we have a good time. And that was in January. In February, he wanted to do another one. And boy, did we have a good time. And last year in November, Rhonda and I spent about a week with Pastor Ben and his leadership crew at Calvary Church. And we just had such a wonderful time. These guys have become such good friends of ours. And I would love it if every one that's a part of the Bethel family got to meet them. And so we're doing that this Friday night. It's either gonna be in the youth center or in the children's center. That decision will be made at the last minute depending on how setups go. But I can't encourage you enough to come and be encouraged, be lifted up, be motivated and reminded who you are in God. Now that's what we talked about last week because it's seven. So what what time are we going to do something on a Friday night? For Charles, it's 643. Yes, I'm sorry, it's seven o'clock. But last week we talked about how, for some reason, a lot of us think that if we are good Christian people, we'll never have to deal with stuff in our lives that we don't like. And we showed very briefly how that's not an idea that you can get from the scripture. That's not an idea that anyone in the Bible talked about or lived. Jesus never even said, hey, follow me and nothing bad will happen to you the rest of your life. Here's the first inappropriate thing I'm going to say. I've heard our founding pastor, Pastor Ron, say for years that if he could just shoot people after the altar call, their lives would be so much better. (laughs) Because the truth is, when you make a public statement that you're going to be following Jesus, our enemy doesn't like that. And he will do whatever he can to stop us. And the Bible's full of that information. We just don't necessarily like it. So the problem is when stuff happens to us that we don't like or that we don't think we should have to deal with, we start to question who we are and who our Father is. 
And so we've spent a lot of our time around here reminding ourselves who our Father is and who we are to Him. And it's easy for us to think, well, God doesn't really care about us. He just wants to ruin our fun. He just wants to control how we live. He doesn't really care about us. We're not special to Him. If you were raised in church, you might have been raised with the idea that Christians are the people that God is most irritated with. I was always raised with the idea that Christians were the people that God was really disappointed in. And that's not scriptural. Last week we read in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter says starting in verse 9, you are not like that. You are a chosen people. What does chosen mean? You were picked. Go back to fourth grade, standing on the playground, getting ready to play dodgeball. I was always the guy that went to the team that had one last pick. Because I was standing there by myself, nobody wanted me on their team. I always wanted to be the kid that got picked first. Well, guess what? You are chosen people. You are people that God chose. And he chose you because he knows you and he loves you. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. One of the ideas that we run across over and over and over and over again in the New Testament is that the blessings that God pours out on his people are for them to pour out on other people. And when God shows us how good he is, that's for us to go show other people how good God is. Now, strangely enough, my experience with Rhonda being in the hospital was not a particularly positive one this time. I am not a fan of large organizational bureaucracy. And just the number of phone calls I had to make yesterday to find somebody who could tell me whether or not she was going to get to come home was frustrating to me. And finally, we got all the details worked out. Because the hospital campus is still, I guess you could call it locked down because of COVID restrictions, the nurse knew that we were going to need help getting Rhonda out and all that. So she said, here's what we want you to do. Go into the, where the 24-hour pharmacy is. That part's always open. She's got a couple prescriptions that you can pick up there anyway. Then right past the pharmacy is where the visitor station used to be. I say used to be, it's all still there. They just don't have anybody working there anymore. And she said, call when you get there and we will bring Rhonda to you, give you all the instructions that you'll need regarding her oxygen and the treatment and what she's gonna need at home. And you can get her in the car and you guys can go home. And I said, thank you, good. And because... As my children keep reminding me, I am getting more elderly. (laughs) I had Wendy listening to the instructions and repeating them too, because I guess I forget things. Because my kids keep reminding me that I'm getting more and more elderly, I guess I forget things. (laughs) Oh, come on folks, that was a joke. Because my kids keep reminding me. (laughs) So we talked to each other, made sure we knew what we were doing. We went into the pharmacy. Wendy got her prescriptions. We went out and stood at the visitor center and waited for about 45 minutes. Honestly, to be able to take Rhonda home, I'll wait. And we're standing there and we're standing there, and we're standing there. And Angela looks up, and she sees somebody come in the doors at the end of the hallway, and she goes, is that Nicole Edwards? 
And Wendy looks at her and says, yeah, that's Nicole. And we all waved. And Nicole says, we're all out here with Rhonda. Now, my first question was, who's we all? Well, there's a whole group of ladies that came to give Rhonda a cheering section when she came out of the hospital. Margie was out there, Mandy was out there, Nicole was out there, Charlotte was out there. There are all sorts of people out there. They got balloons, they got flowers. And they've been out there for 40 minutes. (laughs) And I said, well, we're waiting where they told us to wait. And then you heard those words. Oh, they were wrong. Don't you love it when the person you get your information from is wrong? Just as a sidebar, if you spend much time at all watching the news, the person you're getting your information from is wrong. Okay, be be very careful about stuff like that. So we walk outside. I'm instantly in a lousy mood because I've been waiting there for 40 minutes. My wife who just got out of the hospital has been sitting outside. Does anybody remember what the temperature was yesterday? Yeah, it was 102 when we were out there. We walked out and everybody's like, yay! And I walked up and gave Rhonda a hug for the first time in a week and a half. And I said, do you want me to take you to the car or do you want me to go get the car? And she said, you can go get the car. And I said, I can do that. And I walked away. I'm sure the whole group thought, what's wrong with Pastor Mike? Well, Pastor Mike was ready to smack somebody in the head. (laughs) I went and got the car, figured out how to get where I was going, pulled up, helped get Rhonda in the car. The girls got in the car. We got the breathing tank and all the stuff and all Rhonda's stuff. It's amazing how much stuff you can collect in a hospital. And we said goodbye to everybody. Then I'm driving home. I was ticked off. And I had the thought, why does stuff like this happen to... Why shouldn't stuff like that happen to me? Doesn't it happen to everybody else? I don't know that there's a person in here who hasn't dealt with some bureaucracy of some kind like that. Why shouldn't it happen to me? It's not going to not happen because I'm one of God's special people. The promise, as we heard over and over again this morning, was when it does happen, God is with me. Somebody was sitting in the car, whispering in my shoulder, you're missing the point here, Rhonda's home. Have you ever let something that big and that important irritate you and distract you from something that big and that important? The girls and I are walking around and we got Rhonda unloaded and she walked over and sat down on the couch and I could just feel her decompress. And then all three of the cats walked in and said, who are you? (laughs) Oh yeah, you can scratch me. Rhonda's home. Was it irritating? Yes. So what? I'll get over it. Peter goes on in verse 10. Once you had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Folks, who are you? You're God's people. Do God's people ever get frustrated? Of course. Then we remind ourselves, we're God's people. That is our identity. For some reason, we choose a lot of things in this culture to be our identity. And the only one that matters is whether or not you are God's people. Peter says, once you received no mercy, now you've received God's mercy. Oh darn, 
I've received God's mercy. That I was thinking last night, that hospital and those poor people that work at that hospital are absolutely packed full of folks that people don't care about. And there are people there whose lives would change if they were ever to experience God's mercy. Where do they experience God's mercy? From God's people. As we're getting Rhonda in the car, I hear her say something like, yeah, yeah, it's called Bethel. We're right on Van Buren, about a block south of Victoria. And the nurse says, you know, you guys got a great group of people here. I'm going to come see what you're all about. I'm frustrated and annoyed. I'm in a bad mood. Rhonda's inviting people to church. (laughs) Which one of us was doing it right? (laughs) Last week we talked about how so often we think that there's this checklist of things we're going to have to do to motivate God to help us. Sometimes I think about how much time and energy I've spent praying, trying to convince God that I'm somebody worthy of his attention. Well, Peter just explained that we are God's special people. We're with God because he chose us. We don't have to convince God that we're worth his attention. Jesus says in Matthew 11, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Jesus is not setting up a bunch of hoops for us to jump through to convince him to help. Well, you have to watch this much Christian TV. You have to read this many Christian books. You have to read this much scripture. You have to have this many verses painted on the wall of your house. You have to drive the right kind of car with the correct bumper sticker. I remember once years and years ago, I was in the church van with a bunch of church kids and we were going out to do something. And we were right there on Van Buren at Indiana, sitting at the light. And I looked up and the truck in front of me says, honk if you love Jesus, which I've learned not to do. Got tired of getting flipped off. It says, honk if you love Jesus. On the other side of the window, it says, tight butts drive me nuts. Well, see, that person can only get half of something from God because they're not marking off the checklist. Jesus isn't fond of our checklists. He says, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens. I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy to bear. The burden I give you is light. Why do we think it's such hard work being one of God's people? Jesus clearly says it's not. If you find yourself in the position of desiring something from God and trying to figure out what the checklist is that you've got to finish before he'll give it to you, I think you're misguided. That's not what Jesus is talking about. So it brings us to an interesting question. I think everybody has always lived in interesting times. It's just as we move on, we all tend to assume that the times we're living in are the worst. 
I saw a great picture. I love history anyway. But I saw a great picture from a Sacramento newspaper in 1918. And at the top of it, in huge letters, it said, wear your mask. Because it was in the middle of the Spanish flu epidemic. Now, because I like history, I know that one of the things they found out in 1918 (laughs) was that not only did masks not help, they caused people harm. But this was the mandate from the government. And people generally will do what they're told if what they're told makes sense. And then I saw a picture of a boxing match that was taking place taking place in San Francisco. I believe it said there were 45,000 people there. And all around the boxing ring were people with their faces covered. And for the first three rows or stuff inside right next to the ring were all of the politicians and important people. What'd you say, Charles? Ah, my foot keeps slipping off this chair. With no masks. Does any of that sound familiar? The difference is, a hundred years ago, that made people angry. Nowadays, we don't seem to care enough. Times have never been like this before. Yes, they have. I believe King Solomon said something along the lines of, there's nothing new under the sun. Sometimes we just keep going through stuff because we don't learn our lessons. So when things happen, why are we here? Are we here to spend our time praying not to be affected by the things that happen? I don't think so. In in fact, in 1 Peter chapter 4, In verse 12, Peter says, Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Now, Margie, there's a verse to have painted in really nice script and put on the wall of your house. Don't be surprised at the stuff you're going through, like it's strange. You know what that tells me? That tells me that Charles is going to go through stuff. But even worse than that, it tells me that I'm going to go through stuff. It tells me that Robert's going to go through stuff. And none of it is strange. He goes on, instead, be very glad. Oh boy, I'm going through stuff again. Yay! I get to sit out on my deck at three in the morning watching the ambulance take my wife to the hospital. Yay! I found out later they took her to the wrong hospital. (laughs) They opened the doors to let her out at Kaiser, except they're at Riverside Community. And and talk about giving you confidence. The driver said, we're not supposed to be here. Now, when I get that bill, I'm going to look and see if there are any mileage charges. (laughs) My wife got taken away in an ambulance and they went to the wrong hospital. Yay! Why in the world would Peter say, be very glad? He says, but be very glad for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering. Oh yeah. When you've read through the gospels, have you noticed that things didn't always go right for Jesus? You know, all the way until the point where they killed him for doing nothing wrong. I just want to be a partner with the Lord. Great. But understand, that means 
we're going to go through some stuff. He says, partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. If we go through the same things that Jesus went through, and he goes through them with us, we get the same reward that he gets. Peter says, we will get to be in the middle of God's glory when Jesus is revealed to the world. I told the group here on Wednesday night that an older family friend, well, all of my parents' family friends are older, um, one of the guys that I had grown up with passed away a couple of weeks ago. And his goal in life was to be here when Jesus came back. And his wife said, missed it. Because as I've pointed out, everybody who's ever lived who wanted to be here when Jesus came back has missed it if they've already died. But then we were all laughing because his name is Ken. It's not that Ken's going to miss Jesus' return. He's just going to experience it from the other side. He's not going to be here when Jesus returns. He's going to be with Jesus when Jesus returns. We get to experience that glory. Now, Paul writes to the church that he founded in Philippi about a similar situation. Interestingly enough, involving Paul's struggles and how he wanted his friends and his supporters to react. Now, this passage of scripture illustrates one of my pet peeves, which is how sometimes we as Christians will pull a verse completely out of context and make it mean something almost opposite to what it means. And this passage of scripture, I'm, I'm going to show you how we do that. Paul says in chapter 4, verse 4, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you're considerate in all you do, and remember the Lord is coming soon. See, that's where I didn't quite reach the mark yesterday. I was more annoyed than I was considerate. And it didn't help that I knew it at the time. But God's still working on me. He says, don't worry about anything. How big is that word anything, by the way? Anything is a big word. Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Why? God doesn't know what you need? Of course God knows what you need. We need to finish the sentence. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. You know, I hate to say it, but sometimes I forget what God has done. And a need presents itself, and my first response is, oh my gosh, how can we possibly meet this need? And then someone has to remind me how every other need in my entire life has been met. It's God. There's nothing wrong with telling God what you need. But you're not telling God what you need to remind him that he needs to take care of you. You're telling God what you need so that you then thank him for all he's done. It's one of the reasons we get together and we talk about what God has done. Because you know, God has done a lot of things in my life. But God's also done a lot of things in Steve's life. And sometimes the things God has done in Steve's life 
apply to what I need done in my life? Have you ever been encouraged by somebody else's testimony? Of course. Which is why we tell each other the things that God has done. It's one of the experiments I do on social media. I follow people's posts and I kind of in my head keep track of what they talk about most. And I got to admit, I feel sorry for a lot of church folks who I never read anything except politics. Because it tells me what's on their heart. Think about how few people you see on social media who talk about what God is doing. (laughs) I decided a long time ago I did not want that to be me. Paul goes on, thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. Don't worry about anything. Tell God what you need. Thank him for all he's done. Then you will experience God's peace. You know what Paul hasn't mentioned here yet? God meeting your need. You want to let something twist your head around a little bit? Realize that having God's peace is disconnected from getting what you think you need. Having God's peace is a result of your relationship with him and focusing on the things he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. Then Paul says in verse 8, And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts. Who chooses what we think about? Who chooses what I think about? I do. Who gets to fix my thoughts? I do. Can I choose what you think about? No. I can do what I can to maybe encourage you, but I can't pick what you think about. My guess is that every one of you has people that you know that are negative. And no matter what's happening, if you want the negative perspective, you can talk to them. Those are the yeah, but people. Wow, look at that. That's neat. Well, yeah, but. Rhonda's finally home from the hospital. Well, yeah, but she's still on oxygen. She's on oxygen at home. You know, I can choose where I fix my thoughts. Do I think about my wife being at home? Do I think about how much joy I get watching my daughter's take care of us and thanking God that they're both such good cooks? (laughs) (laughs) Or do I fix my thoughts on how unfair this whole situation is? That's my choice. Paul says, fix your thoughts on what is true what is honorable, what is right, what is pure, what is lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. In other words, don't spend a lot of time watching the news because you get almost none of that. Paul says, keep putting into practice All that you're learning and have received from me, everything you've heard from me and saw me doing, then the God of peace will be with you. 
how we choose to behave matters. And sometimes we don't get to experience God's peace because how we're choosing to behave doesn't allow God's peace. Paul doesn't pull any punches here. He says, how I praise the Lord that you are concerned about me again. I know you have always been concerned for me, but you didn't have the chance to help me. Not that I was ever in need, for I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. There's a verse that you don't see around very often. I've learned to be content with whatever I have. I was sitting at a table last Thursday night with our family, except for Rhonda, celebrating her dad's birthday. And we were at Market Broiler. And we know how to eat. And there was a tremendous display of food on that table. I could be content sitting at a table like that. Couldn't you? I had a nice big bowl of clam chowder. There was shrimp of different kinds. There was fish. There were potatoes. There, I mean, there was just all sorts of stuff. I don't know what everybody got. But I noticed that we were all pretty content sitting at that table. And when they came around and they had the hot fudge sundae for Ron's birthday, and the hot fudge sundae went around the table, we were all content. Paul understands that it's easy to be content when you have everything you might want. But he says, I've learned how to be content even when I have need. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. As I grew up, I watched my grandparents and all of their generation who came of age during the Great Depression. And I watched my grandparents especially, how they lived turning into a game how God was going to meet their family needs. Grandpa was an accountant. He had five kids. The doctors told him when they got married, they would never be able to have kids, so they stopped at five. <laughs> we used to tease Grandpa because he bought new clothes when his clothes wore out. That means he was still wearing polyester leisure suits into the late 90s. By then, they were hip again. When Grandpa passed away at 93, he was still driving the 1971 Ford Maverick four-door that he bought in 1971. You know why? It ran. Why would I get a new car? That one works. But he passed away and gave it to one of my cousins who drove it for years. Now me, I get itchy every couple of years if I'm not driving something new. That doesn't mean I get to drive something new. <laughs> you guys know me. We drive our cars a long time. But I watched as my grandparents and most of the people in that generation had figured out how to get by on almost nothing. My daughters and I were talking this week, Wendy teaches U.S. history, and the way things are presented, especially to younger people, is there are too many people in the world. The world can't possibly support all the people, and it's not fair for all these people to bring more people into the world when we can't even feed the ones we have. And I love pointing out 
that the last study I saw, over 60% of the food grown in the United States, you know what happens to it? It gets thrown away. Because we have literally so much food, we could not possibly eat it all. Well, we should send it to all the poor people who need food. Unless there are very odd circumstances, the only people who really need food are in that condition because of politics. Oh, but what about the great famine in Eastern Europe in the 30s? Seven million people starved to death. Yes, they did. And I mean literally starved to death. You know why? Because it suited the communist government purpose. And they did it on purpose. I don't know too many people in our country nowadays who are in need. Are there things we want? Of course. I think about that when I'm sitting at home and I look at my little itty bitty 70 inch TV and I think, you know, that 85 at Sam's Club looks awful nice. I think that God should recreate the Van Buren drive-in in my, in my den. Just think about some of the stuff we complain about. Paul is saying, I learned how to be content with everything. That's easy. I've learned how to be content with nothing. I've learned the secret of living in every situation, whether it's with a full stomach or an empty stomach with plenty or little. Verse that we pull out of context and put on a poster and make us feel good. For I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. He's talking about getting by with nothing if we need to. And I hesitate to suggest that sometimes that means that the situations that we are in are not going to go we, the way we like them to go. We're not going to get everything we want. I mean, good grief, TJ, if we got everything we want, why would we want to go to heaven? We're never going to get everything we want. Sometimes things are going to happen that we don't like. Sometimes things are going to happen that we don't think are fair. The girls and I were sitting at Brandon's getting ready to order dinner Sunday night. Kind of decompressing out of all this stuff with Rhonda going to the hospital and all the things we've been dealing with around here. And Wendy's phone rings. And my dad's fallen at home and can't get up. I did not immediately say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I said, are you kidding? We were going to go over to my parents and see what was going on, but Angela's the only one in the family who's not tested positive, so she can't go. So we have to take her home first. And we go to her apartment and drop her off and then go over to my parents' house. And dad's not hurt. He's just fallen and he can't get himself up. And for some reason, my mom at 78 can't help him. So my brother Joel and Wendy and I got dad up. Got him all put back together. He walked out, sat down on the couch. We had a nice visit. After about an hour, hour and a half, we all took off and went our own directions. Told mom, if something happens, you call us. But she didn't. Because about 10.30 that night, he went into the bathroom and then hollered at her and said, I can't get up. So she called 911. The paramedics got there. 
as they're sitting in the dining room going over all the information, getting ready to pack dad up and take him to the hospital. He comes walking out of the bathroom holding the magazine and says, what's going on? But my mom was not in a condition to face being alone that night. So she had him taken to the hospital. She couldn't go with him, but he went to the hospital. He was there until yesterday afternoon, trying to get him stabilized, trying to get him in a situation where he can take care of himself a little better. So after me explaining to you what's going on in our family and how Rhonda's in the hospital and we're dealing with all of this stuff, that night, my dad went in the hospital. And I said, you know, in football, they used to have a penalty called piling on. This feels like piling on. And a very little small voice said, are you alone? I said, no, sir. Not only am I surrounded by family, I'm living in God. God is living in me. I have his son in my heart. I have his Holy Spirit indwelling in me every moment of every day. Do I like what's happening? No. Did God do what's happening? No. Is he going to help us get through what's happening? Absolutely. When word got out about what Rondo was going through and then what my dad was dealing with, it shouldn't surprise me anymore, but watching my church family jump into action praying, it's just amazing. We are so blessed by being a part of a church family that understands their role in the body of Christ. We had people from all over the country, from all over the world, just messaging us quickly about how they're holding Rhonda and Dave up before the Father. They're praying for us that we'll be strong and that we'll be encouraged. It might be that God has something for us to do when it looks like things are going wrong. I maintain that when things are going wrong, we're in the midst of people who need to experience God's love. Maybe for the first time. And if we're in the midst of things that are going wrong and we know God's love, we're the ones that God has there to help the people around us. Even if it's a nurse you've never met before who just moved into Riverside and is looking for a church. Even if it's somebody who just needs a kind word or maybe a meal or some help. There were people who helped my dad for a week that I will never meet. But boy, am I thankful. There are people who helped Rhonda for a week and a half that I'll never meet. But I'm helpful. And in any dealings with them, I want to make sure that what they're experiencing through me is the love of God. Can I get frustrated and picky? Sure. But that's not why I'm here. I'll finish up with this. In Hebrews chapter 10, starting in verse 23, the author says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm, for God can be trusted to keep his promise. Is God a good God? Yes. Can he be trusted to take care of his kids? 
yes, then I need to act like it. I need to hold tightly without wavering to that hope. Is that always going to be easy? No. But look what, what we're told. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. When I'm tempted to waver in the hope that I have, my church family encourages me. Rhonda and the girls and I sat there just looking at message after message after message after message, encouraging us and reminding us of where our hope comes from. As we've dealt with other people who are in very similar and other situations, we want to be encouraging. Bless you. We want to help each other maintain the attitude that we're supposed to have. And folks, it's one of the things that's bothered me so much about this COVID situation is how quickly and easily so many people in the body of Christ have just said, oh, well, we can't come to church. I was laughing with a gentleman at the school open house, the barbecue. And I was saying how I keep looking through the Bible and I can't find any asterisks. And he looked at me and I said, you know, don't neglect your church meetings, asterisk, unless somebody tells you it's not safe. The Bible doesn't say that. I've maintained the whole time. If God tells you to keep your butt at home, keep your butt at home. If he didn't, he's already told us not to quit going to church. This is where we need each other. And our community is full of people who need what we have and take for granted. They're not getting the love of God. They're not getting the encouragement. They're not getting the protection that you and I enjoy every day. Could it be that God has us here to do something? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for today. Father, this is not a week or two or three that I ever would have asked you for. But I didn't need to. You knew it was coming and you are with me every step of the way. I can feel that. It is the only reason I'm able to keep going and make it through the things you have for me. I thank you for the church family that you've put around me. I thank you that we support each other, we encourage each other, we love each other because we know you and we have experienced your love for us. So Father, I ask as plainly as you can do it, show us what we're here to do. When someone needs a hand, when someone needs an encouraging word, point them out to us, remind us that that's why we're here. And when things are not going the way we want, help us see what you're doing in the midst of that so that we can continue to be with you and enjoy your presence. Now, Father, I thank you for my church family and whatever you have for us this week. I thank you that your blessing and your protection surround us and you'll bring us back safely next time. I pray all this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. <laughs>